is your solution for this homework that's due Wednesday of part A in each problem. Um, and if you haven't gotten one, you can you can beg somebody to get one. No, you can uh, you can stop by uh, my office and I'll give. You, I have only one. How many have not gotten that? Two. Okay. All right. Um, you're gonna be in the other class, so I'll I'll, uh, I'll give it to you. Okay. Um, let me uh, hold on to it, it's, uh, and then I'll give it to you at the end of the class. Okay. Um, let's see. We're in chapter seven, so we have to talk about. We ha still have some things to talk about. Um, and there are two problems that are in the exercises that I don't have really time to. I mean, I don't want to assign them, but here I give them the, with the solutions. Um, there are these Murphy's laws, two two instances of Murphy's laws. Of course, Murphy's law applies to everything. Um, but I thought it would be kind of interesting, so you can uh, look at how wonderful probability is explaining weird things. Um, I mean, unexpected things, right? Or, or things that actually happen too often that um, you would prefer not to, not to happen. Um, so, okay, so let me um, state this theorem. So, oops, so we talked about, um, we talked about the, sta the standard, excuse me, the um, Gaussian density function or normal distribution last time. And I mentioned that very briefly. I said that um, although this is, this is certainly a typical example, I mean, uh, an example of of, of a density function. So I'm going to remind you of that. So that's um, so the standard normal distribution uh, is well, as you know. Well, we don't. We, we we said that for a continuous random variable, the density function is the derivative of the distribution function, right? So the distribution function would be the integral of the of the density function. And the density function was, I think we used g little g. So this is the integral of one over square of two pi e to the minus x squared over 2 dx. Okay. Does anybody um, made that computation that the this density function actually integrates to 1? No. So I said, remember last time we, we talked about the reason for this factor. This factor is just so that Right. So as, so as, uh, as, as, say it again. As t goes to infinity. Yeah, you have all that t. Right. But the integral goes. To, so, so, so this is the bell-shaped curve, right? Which has an inflection at positive one and negative one. So this is g zero one of t of x. Okay, and um, and this this height comes. So excuse me, this uh, factor here comes from the fact that negative infinity infinity of e to the minus x squared over two is square root of two pi, right? And I, I said try this as an exercise in double integrals, basically, right? Which implies that. Uh, the integral from negative infinity to infinity 
of g, so that's you divide by 1 over square root of pi, and that's where you get 1, right? So the area around this curve is 1. Also, we said um, because of this normalization, uh, what's the area on the. So, other fun facts. Integral from negative 1 to 1 is about 68, 0.068. Integral from negative 2 to 2. Point nine five, and uh, integral from, and so on, right? So y you can actually tabulate this. Uh, also, let's say there is so-called an error function What's the error function? Use the integral from zero to t of this. Okay, and it has um, I think it's built in MATLAB for sure, but I just want to make sure. Um, Okay, so it's slightly different. Um, no, actually, no. I think once you make a change of variables, uh, you see how this thing is. So up to a change of variables, this is e to the minus t squared, not t squared over 2. So you'd have to take uh, square root of t over square root of 2 as a change of variable. Okay, so. Um, so there's just one one non-elementary function that that one has um, handy. So so I'm just gonna say it's up to you know it's related to this. Okay. We're not gonna use this, uh, but okay. So and and uh, and the distribution, the normal distribution, is actually the antiderivative of of this density function, which antiderivative is the one that goes to zero at negative infinity, right? So the um, remember the, the distribution function has to start at negative infinity at zero, increase, and asymptotically go to one, right? So it's a function of t. Okay, so that's the reason why I go from negative infinity to, to t and not from, I don't know, some number. You could start from any number, right, and you still get an antiderivative. But it won't have that property that it goes to zero as t goes to negative infinity. Okay, so, um, so here's the, the central limit theorem. So it says that for a sequence of identically distributed distributed independent random variables In short, is I I D R V so I guess independent identical distributed random variables with uh, with mean with expect with with expected value denoted by mu so 
So again, this is true for any of the random variables because they're all uh, identically distributed, right? And the standard deviation sigma, so the square of the sigma is the variance. And again, this is true for any, I mean, this, this should be for any xi. And I will remind you what the variance, variance is, the expected value of x minus mu squared. Okay, then we can talk about the following event. The event that x1 plus xn minus n times mu divided by sigma squared of n is less than t. So, right, this is an event. In the sample space, you take all outcomes for which this inequality holds. Okay? And this makes an event. This probability is getting closer and closer, so converges as n goes to infinity to this normal distribution. So this, I, I repeat this formula is integral negative infinity to t of 1 over square 2 pi to minus x squared over 2 dx. Okay, so that's, so we're not going to uh, go through the proof or anything, but it's a major, it's a major, uh, you know, tool in, uh, in probability theory. So uh, what I'd like to do is, is just show you how this, how we use this in, you know, simple models. So here's an interpretation. So, for example, imagine that we want to, um, so if we want to um, estimate the probability of the event that x1 plus xn minus n mu is between well let me let me do it like this over sigma n is between two values. And I'm picking a negative one and one uh, just to illustrate, but if it's between two values, this this actually um, well the choice of negative one and one is so that we fall within the first uh, one deviation, standard deviation from the mean for the normal distribution. But just this could be three and five, doesn't matter, right? So any two numbers. So that would be your z value for, on, on the normal distribution. Right. Then we can write so we can write this probability of this event. Let's give it a name. So this we want to call this event A, right? So we want to write this as as well. I guess we can we can rewrite this event as. Uh, 
um, difference between two events. One event is that one inequality happens, so I'm going to use the less than or equal than minus or it should be um, right, so it's going to be minus as, as sets, so right, as set, the probability that the other inequality doesn't happen. Okay? Right, because I have, so my event A is actually consists of, it's the intersection of, well, it's not the intersection, it's actually the difference between, between, um, um, so this is going to be the larger, so this is where things are less than 1, and this is where the things are less than negative 1, right? Right? So what, what we're computing here is the probability where this expression is between negative 1 and 1. Okay. And because of this, we can, we can write that the probability of A is the difference of the two probabilities, right? So the probability of let's give this a name, so this is going to be um, this B and this is C, right? Probability of B minus C and C is, C is a subset of B so this is the probability of B minus the probability of C sub-event, right? or subset Okay, so in essence what I have is we have that probability of this ratio x1, xn minus n, n mu over sigma square of n is less than or equal than 1 minus the probability that the same thing is less than negative 1. Now, we should be careful with the strict and less than or equal than. Um, I guess to avoid, if you want to, if you want to avoid that, well, one one way to say is um, put the strict inequality here, and then this would be less than or equal than, right? For instance, and then also, and then you have to deal with the What's the probability of that, that, that expression equals negative one, right? That would be uh, that would be relevant if, if the if, for instance if the variables are discrete random variables. Okay. But as n goes to infinity, here's what you can you can uh, conclude from this computation. You can conclude that this thing goes to G zero one of t of one, excuse me, right? And this goes to G zero one of negative one. Okay. So this is the integral from negative infinity to one of the density function minus the negative infinity to negative one of the density function. This is the same as the integral from negative one to one. Of g zero one of t of x dx. Okay. Which we said is a sixty eight percent, right? So as n as n is uh, as n is large, uh, the probability that that uh, that ratio is between negative one and one is close to, we're not saying really how close, we don't have that uh, rate of convergence well, it's not part of this uh, statement, but it's it's approaching, as n goes to uh, infinity, it's approaching this number, right? So, that's true in general so more general
the, uh, excuse me, the probability that and I'll, t I'll say in a second uh, w why do we I mean we have to stick with this with this kind of uh, s strange ratio because that's uh, what cent central limit theorem um, tells you about but this goes to integral from a to b of g 0 1 of x standard normal um, well it's basically the integral or the area under the curve bell-shaped curve between a and b okay and again to be very precise one should put strictly less than right in case uh, a is in, ca in case x is discrete random variable so for us the practical uh, practical um, implication of this is for instance uh, the, what's the probability of the event that this ratio always the same ratio is between negative 2 and 2 when n is large right so in the limit this is approximately on the limit is exactly the integral from negative 2 which in 95 percent and this is this is also approximate right so there's it's not actually, none of this is, well, in the limit this will be equality, but this is not equality, right? It's close to 95%. So we, we say the following, we say that the probability that, and let me rephrase this, instead of this ratio, I'm going to put, I'm going to rephrase the event, but it's the same event, right? That the sum minus n times the mean is between what? 2 sigma square root of n minus 2 sigma square root of n is close to 95 percent for n large. Okay. One could actually rephrase even even you know you can you can have different uh, ways to look at this. For instance, you could actually rephrase that event by dividing by n both si all three sides right of this inequality. And again, the probability of this is close to 95%. So in this, uh, in this in this form, you can see something that uh, we talked before. We said that if I have a sequence of independent random, uh, identically distributed random variables, then what was happening? This Average, right, was converging to the mean, to the to the expected value, right. So, so this statement is actually, in a way, it's a more precise uh, information about how close this average is to to the mean, to the expected value, uh, because these guys go to zero, right. So as n, as n gets large, this gets close to zero. So this is as the probability of, of this difference being less than this small quantity, right? But again, the small quantity depends on n, so it's, it's a little bit delicate, is, is 95%. Okay? So in a way, it's, it's, a, it's adding more information about the average of the sequence of, of random variables, right? Um, but in a, in a kind of very particular fashion, so it's not um, it's not totally kind of on top of this strong law of, of large number. 
Okay, the final one that uh, I think we're going to use in this in this example is um, one last one, one last reformulation. Is that simply if you are interested in the sum and you want to know you want to know uh, well where where does that sum um, end up being well. If you're looking above here, and you and you and you you add n mu on on all sides, you're gonna see this two sigma square root of n and uh, n mu minus two sigma square root of n. So this is with probability not close to ninety five percent. Okay. So maybe that's probably what's the most, I guess, relevant for, for what we do, for the examples we do. Okay. So so um, the example that is here in the book, uh, where this um, where this gets applied, is basically. An emergency service example. So let me uh, say this house fire problem if you want. So it says that an emergency service receives an average of 171 calls per month for house fires over the past year. On the basis of this data, the rate of house fire emergencies was estimated at 171 per month. The next month were only 153 calls received, and the question is, does this indicate an actual reduction in the rate of house fires, or is it simply a random fluctuation? So. So it looks kind of out of the blue in a way because um, we don't really know what the random what the random variable is, right? Um, well, so in this modeling, we have to start saying, you know, what are the you know how do you reinterpret this? What are the what are the random variable? What is the random variable? Okay, and. Um, That can be kind of tricky, I think. But um, if if we agree to, to to pick the random variable to be time between arrivals, between excuse me, between um, fire calls, okay. well, between fire call, I guess, and 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 uh, n plus one. Okay. Then this is, this are random variables because, um, well, there, there are um, right. I mean, they're not programmed. So, question is, what is the distribution of such a random variable? Okay. So. I guess one could say that they are independent because. You can never predict based on uh, well any 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 single random variable is independent of the others, right? Because the, the fires are are coming at uh, at random times. So the distribution of x n is assumed to be um, is assumed to be of exponential type. So what does that mean? It 
that is uh, the density function is f of x equals lambda e to the minus lambda x. Okay, so this is very different from the normal distribution, by the way. Um, the graph of this is, well, I should say if x is positive and zero if x is negative. So the graph is, uh, it starts at some value lambda and then it drops exponentially, right? And then b before zero is zero, so. So this density function is, is like this. Um, now, th there is actually, there are reasons why one, uh, one takes this to be, um, so this assumption is based on, on the nature of this time of arrival, okay? So arrival times usually have exponential uh, distributions. Um, I think in chapter eight, if we if we have time, we're going to talk a little bit about this. But um, so so, what is the expected? What what will be the expected value of this of such a random variable? Remember, is is the uh, integral of x times the density function, right? So if you do this, lambda integral from negative infinity to infinity. Well, lambda is inside, but it can be moved outside, right? So x times lambda e to the minus lambda x dx. I'm sorry, this is only from zero to infinity, right? Because uh, before zero, it's zero. So what is this? Uh, it's lambda times Right, so you do integration by parts, um, and I think what you're going to get, you should get in the end, is that this is actually lambda, uh, one over lambda. So that's something to uh, to remember. And uh, what about the variance for the the, um, the standard deviation? So the standard deviation is square is the variance. So sigma square is the variance of x, and this is the integral from negative infinity to infinity x minus. Uh, the the mean or the ex expected value squared times f of x dx, right? Again, this will reduce the integral from zero to infinity, and um, I guess it takes several integration by parts, right, to to actually uh, get the value of the variance, but it turns out to be. one over lambda squared, meaning that sigma is one over lambda, right? Okay, so this is just the computation of the integral. Um, I don't wanna... I don't wanna do this. Um, Okay, so in a way, it's it's very similar to the uh, Poisson distribution for discrete random variables, where both the expectation and the standard deviation are um, the same, right? And that that same thing is refer uh, is 
uh, connected to the rate at which this this arrivals occur right so when we say so let's see so so if we say that house fires calls average 171 a month number of and we model this um, this uh, random variables with uh, exponential distributions then what will lambda be? So if we say that the the, uh, the average is the 171 average um, well, but the, the the this average one over one over lambda is going to be the the average time between two arrivals, right? So so it means that one over 171 is the expected value, so this is the expected, so let me say, so the expected uh, time between calls would be 1 over 171. And since this is 1 over lambda, it means the lambda is one, 171. Okay. So because of this uh, lambda is 171, it means that the standard deviation is also going to be 1 over, uh, excuse me, one, 1 over 171, okay? So with just this, these two quantities um, and the fact that I guess this sequence of, of Xn is, is uh, IIE, IID, independent uh, and uh, identical distributed random variables then the conclusion is that the sum of the random variables x1 through xn lies between this number n over 171 so that's mu right 1 over 71 plus 2 square root of n over 171 and n 171 minus 2 square root of n over 171 with probability 95 percent. Okay. And the, what, is the, what is the meaning of the sum of, the random, uh, of these random variables? So this would be total time um, for uh, between the first and the nth, first and nth call, right? So I think it's tricky. It's all related. The time frame is months. So if you add up all those x and, and it adds up to one. Exactly. So, so the time frame is one, as is the unit of time is in is in months. So, um, okay. But keep in mind, as we do, as we say this, this is an event, right? So all of this is. It's like you look in the past and you say, well, this many have happened, right? That that's one instance of the experiment, right? That's one run of the experiment. And this is what you observe, right? So these are it's just one out outcome, right? Every month that things happened, it was an outcome of the of that experiment. This is just saying is how likely that is to happen, right? And it says that with it with ninety five percent probability, um, it is likely that this inequality is going to hold true. Okay? Does it mean that the next Month is going to happen? No, but it's very unlikely, right? And I think it's taken to be a standard. Uh, this 95% is taken to be a standard um, um, threshold as to uh, 
so it's, it's called a confidence interval, right? And it's it's uh, it's taken to be the um, if if things happen outside of this, if this is not happening, if this inequality is not happening, then then there is some um, um, external factor that wasn't taken into account. Okay. Otherwise, if this if this inequality happens with this high probability, uh, it's saying that this is a normal fluctuation. Okay. Random fluctuation. So this two standard deviation from the mean um, for the standard normal distribution is actually uh, referred to uh, the um, um, you know to, to be statistically significant with this probability or be within this uh, confidence interval. Yes, except except the density is yes. I mean, the density is not. You see, it's not. Um, it's hard to you know. It's hard to pinpoint where the mean, well the mean is going to be one over. It's somewhere here, right? It's one over one over lambda, right? So that's where that center of mass of this. If you think of the of the of the area on the curve, right, the region on the curve, one over lambda would be uh, the, where the center of mass of this is, right, where it's balanced. Um, so the area to the left equals the area to the right. But you see, it's not symmetric. And then then it's uh, the first sta the standard deviation would be. In this case, would be one over lambda. I mean, it means it goes all the way to zero and then two over lambda, right? Uh, but it's not the same as in the Gaussian distribution, where it's uh, where it's symmetric. So, for instance, probably it's better to think of two two standard deviations from the mean from here. It would be three over lambda, right? That's where what happens. Um, Is that true? No, yeah, it's only with the normal distribution, actually. Yeah. So. Um, Z score. Yeah, so um, yeah, so I don't, I don't know how to best uh, kind of um, interpret this unless uh, I mean for this specific example, it's um, it's saying that um, I mean it's, it, this 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 quantity is used to to determine what's the um, uh, you know what's the confidence interval? What's the uh, probability that within 95% probability uh, the number of calls is going to lie between uh, 171 plus or minus what? Okay. So so during any given month. If you want it um, with n uh, calls, this is going to be, well, it may not be actually 1. It may be slightly less than 1 or slightly bigger than 1, right? But if you want to just get an estimate, uh, just substituting this sum with 1 is going to give you inequalities. That n has to satisfy to have that uh, right. So during any given month with n calls, uh, this is um, 
um, within normal fluctuation, uh, random fluctuation if, if this inequality both hold. Okay. So it would be a question of um, solving these two inequalities for n, and I guess uh, you can solve it many different ways. Um, could even be graphical, but uh, turns out that so n has to be belonging to. You could also be iterative, right? Um, it's going to be between. 147 and 199. Okay, so if the number of calls falls between these two, uh, between uh, within this range, basically it says that uh, it's a it's a normal it's a random fluctuation, right? Outside of that, uh, it would be. You know that something something wasn't taken into account in this in this model. For instance, so you don't have uh, the assumption that you have um, exponential distribution is probably not correct. Okay, so it is twisted. See, I thought the, the, the problem you said that the assumption is exponential distribution is not correct. But the, the central limit there says it doesn't matter where it came from. If you add up 150 of these things, it's going to be normal, no matter what the, what the underlying distribution was. So some things might not be correct, but I wouldn't think it would be the underlying distribution. Because all you looked at is the mean, and you know, you're saying maybe you're... Well, but the assumption is that that, that 171 number is the mean, is the mean right? So. Um, so if you, if you notice that in previous months it doesn't mean you know it's either in the previous months happened so so this this assumption even if it's exponential distribution the mean may not be correct the assumption that the mean is one over one seventy one is not correct. I agree that the mean or the standard deviation yeah. would be incorrect or something that could be correct. That's also, like, that's what you're saying. That's what you're saying. That's what you're saying. Right? But not not the distribution. Yeah, yeah. But so, but also, it's possible that that different between between uh, um, between calls that that they're not independent, right? For instance, they could have different distributions. One can have one distribution, one can have another distribution, right? Some of them could be I don't know arson or something. So, so it's so all, all of the you know all of the assumptions that were that led to this, or or any one of them, can actually you know break this. So yeah, you could have a different distribution for some of the x's. Yes, um, yeah, so they're not, they may be not independent. They may not be independently distributed and stuff like that, yeah. Um, let's see, one of the homework problems that I assigned, and I gave you that, um, I, start, I have you started on that. No. Um, yeah, and the teaser solution. Um, it has basically the same flavor, except that random ver that uh, those uh, those random variables are actually discrete. In problem number two, actually, I'm talking about. So you can see that the key is actually to start with the same um, inequality and then right. So start with this inequality. And um, um, use that information that the central limit theorem gives you to um, to conclude things about the probability, in that case, of faulty diodes or something. Okay, so it's, it's a lot of manipulating. Um, you know, in a way, you take you take out the randomness in your cal calculation. All the randomness is built in this, this central limit theorem, right? That's what you use to 
um, uh, the main assumption on the on the random uh, nature of, the, of these models. But past that, all you have is just um, you know deterministic, just algebraic things that you do, right? So um, I don't know if anybody uh, tried to go further than part A, which was. But I think if you have part A, it shouldn't be hard to um, to extend. You know, I think part A, I think you have 1,000 uh, diodes that you that you uh, test, right? And you find three wrong. But obviously, that's um, so. To to conclude that that that's uh, the probability of something being faulty is may not be accurate, right? I mean, I know it's hard to think, but 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 there is a number that's a probability that something is faulty, right? And it's just not always points. I mean, point three percent. So to narrow it even further, you'd have to to run it more than. I think part B is is, is saying um, increase that to like ten thousand. So basically, you do the computation, and then in part C it says, you know, how much more do you have to increase to Be confident with it, with that uh, you know within that 95 percent confidence that 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 you found you narrow it down to that probability to find the probability. Um, so it's a kind of a, it's an interesting um, well it's just playing with inequalities but some of them are symbolic so uh, it's an interesting use of of I think a computer to to figure those numbers out. Okay. Um, let's see. So, so about this exponential distribution, we'll come back in chapter eight. Uh, we we haven't done, we haven't ex you know talked about uh, you know just basically talked about the expected value and the the variance. Uh, I'm not understanding. Well, so it's it's uh, the sum of this random variable is because each random variable is a time between two calls. The sum of the random variables is basically the time from the first to the nth call. So if if you say you have n calls, uh, you say that the sum is close to one. That is, maybe this is less than one, but n plus one is greater than one. So I guess that would be more more correct. I mean. Yeah, I had a problem with this too, thinking about the. Yeah. The more correct, the, the more correct. The correct way would be that this is less theoretical than one, and then you would, you would, you would, you would use that inequality, right? So you say less theoretical than one, yeah. And then with n plus one is greater than one, and then put, and then you use that inequality, right? Yeah, that would be. So, so, so in other words, you would have to put n plus one here, n plus one here. Yeah. Maybe we should we should have done that, but um, so, this is just such a weird problem the way it's phrased because it's a one month, right? So when you yeah. done over one seventy one, so roughly you're getting a call every five or six hours, right? And when you add up one hundred fifty, you know, what's the average? When you add that up, then it's one hundred seventy one calls. In yeah. Well, so again, you think of the experiment being during a month, record all the all the all the fire calls. That's the experiment. Okay. Then you extract the random variables. You know, are going to take values for each of this for this each run of this experiment. Yeah, I know it's a little bit kind of it's odd to think about it, but but um, remember that in all this, you have to you have to kind of um, formulate. You know what is the sample space? And you have to you have to understand what the sample space is, and that could be sometimes hard to say. But but in words, that's what it is, right? Any given month, in in a any given period of one month, you record the number of 
you record basically the time when when you had a fire call, right? And then x one x one is going to be the first, the time between the first and the second, and so forth. Okay. Now, I'll just tell you my 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 uh, take on this is why don't we? I mean, we should maybe we should just put n plus one n plus one here, right? Well, in the end, you're going to end up with maybe slightly different interval here, right? But probably not a, not a heck of a lot different than this. Maybe some decimals, right? So, so in the end, it's the conclusion of your of your model is um, because these are probabilistic models anyway. It's there's never like a, a, a exact number that you, right that you have to do. Plus, these numbers are not very large to conclude that. You know, maybe the central limit theorem doesn't even is not even correct to, to apply here, and it has to be very large for the central limit theorem to apply. Yeah. One month. It's one day. Yeah. yeah. So so okay. So so x n would be the fraction of the month. I should we should have said. Yeah, because you see you you see when I said the expected expected time between calls, I said it's one over one seventy one. So that's the f f fraction of of the of the one month. Yeah. Okay, all right. So uh, let's see. I think there was another problem, which uh, number uh, number six, which simply is just a computation of this. Uh, it's a discrete random variable, so part A is just um, computation of variance and standard deviation. I mean, uh, of uh, mean, yeah, the Poisson distribution. Um, so that's just basically dealing with a series. I was having trouble understanding what was lambda and what was n and all that. So lambda was still lambda. If you if you treated problem lambda, that would be one seventy one, and n was one fifty three. Mm-hmm. But if you plug those values into that formula, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Okay, so, so, uh, so now we're talking about a different. It's the same. I think it's the same um, general situation, but now we're just talking about a different random variables. So now you call the random variable to be n t, which is number of arrivals during a time interval. So, it's it's a it's a fundamental change that is now you're looking at a different. You observe something else. The same experiment, but you observed something else. It's a number of arrivals during a fixed time interval. And that has a basic Poisson distribution. Okay, and again, that's, we're not really talking about why, but we're just saying that has that kind of distribution at any either rate, right? So there's a lambda there, exactly. So what is that expected value of number of arrivals during any given time interval? Like if time is one, it's going to be 171, right? So yeah, and in that problem, your lambda, your lambda is 171. But if our sample space is 153, your sample space is 153. Is 153. Yes. Then the equation has you taking 171 to the power of 153. Yes. How do you do it on, on your question is how do you do it on, on a on a computer, right? right. So I guess you use number theory Yeah, so so right, so I mean so the, the task at least in part B I think is is to basically sum up a bunch of I don't know, thirty six values. Uh, so, so in part seven, part B, six, part B, in your homework is 
uh, basically take a sum from 153 to 1 is this is this what uh, yeah to 1 um, oh okay well, they want to know what the probability 171 minus 18 171 plus 18 okay, okay there you go. whatever these numbers are okay and you want to find this sum right Okay, so the, there's a legitimate question, how do you sum this up and by hand? It would be impossible, right? So, um, let's see, one thing is, one thing you can do is, so this would be e to the minus lambda t, lambda t to the n over n factorial. Um, so, So there are two ways to do it. One in MATLAB, there is actually built-in Poisson distribution, which I believe is called Poisson, right? Uh, no, there's no. Hmm. Does anybody remember what that is? What that function is? Okay, uh, so that's that's the Poisson uh, distribution, and by the way, it's a part of the statistics toolbox. So I think you need to have that. Um, oh yeah, okay. So you see this one here. So plus uh, PDF. Okay, so it'll just compute those values. I mean, so that that will take care of it. Yeah. No, 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 this is the script. You just, it's, yeah, you just have to do the series. Yep. Um, okay, and... Uh, so that should answer your question? Yes, I agree. Um, so, so the the other way, what I would what I would say is, you can actually make this in a loop, um, as follows. So you can um, do the following. Let's see. So, um, so how do you do this in MATLAB? E to minus lambda, lambda to the n over n factorial. Well, uh, let's see. So you do. Lambda e to the minus lambda, lambda times lambda n times, divided by one times two times n. So you can uh, let's see. Turns out if lambda is big, that's going to be fairly small, right? So one thing to do is is you can uh, do the following: e to the minus lambda plus n, and then divide lambda into one times e, n times e. When lambda is close to n, and that's what you have in your case, that's lambda is is 171, and, and n is close to 171, right? Mm -hmm. Then you can actually implement this product. Iterate. So you can you can start with this ratio, then multiply by the next, and the next, and the next. All of these ratios are are reasonable numbers, right? And then this is also not 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 too small or too large number, okay? And then you sum this for all for all ends. That's a good exercise to to implement in a code. Any other questions or something? Yeah. So what's the standard deviation? It turned out to be 13.7. So it wasn't 18, but 
Right. Well, but what, what it, it's telling you to, uh, this is not, 18 is not standard deviation. So what, what is 18? It's just given to you as, as a number to say, compute, what's the likelihood that the number of, 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 of calls is, be, is within that range? Oh, okay. And that's, yeah, so it's not a standard deviation. Standard deviation is probably what you said. Uh, then the next question is, is what if you increase that 18, or how much do you have to increase that 18 to get what? What's part C? Uh, okay. To be at the normal variation, okay? okay? And again, that will not be the standard deviation. That'll be at the 90% level. It'll be two times the standard deviation, right? No, no, because these are not. So these are discrete random variables. They have their own distribution, and it's not a Gaussian distribution. Okay. So it's behind all of this is a central limit theorem saying, you know, that 95% uh, um, uh, uh, confidence interval is determined, or, or, or yeah, so the range of, 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 of n of number of calls to be within that standard, st standard uh, is fluctuation, random fluctuation is what you need to determine. And it won't be it won't be necessarily a standard deviation of that random variable, right? I mean standard deviation isn't the standard deviation of the Poisson distribution the same as yes. it's the square root of, of lambda? So it's the square root of, so that's that's it, right? That's right. That's part A, right? Yeah, yeah so it's part A. It's the square root of lambda, right? But it's it's not the same as computing that confidence interval. Um, let's see. So the the only one that uh, well, there are two problems. I'll leave number seven since I. In a way, it's kind of similar to to this Murphy's law. So if you'd like to look at uh, eight and nine, well maybe nine. Um, it's again kind of a discrete. No, it's not. What am I talking about? So number seven, I think it's just a counting sort of problem. Um, I think I gave you the number part A, so at least you know how to set it up. Um, and uh, leave the exercise 16 because we haven't talked about uh, normal distribution, it's about the diffusion. Okay. Oh, so we don't have to do 16. Yeah. So we. So I'll. Um, we'll talk about it on Wednesday. Okay. And let's see, so Wednesday I'll have to, um, so we'll talk about diffusion, I'll start chapter 8, uh, and then I'll have the FCQ, so we'll have to quit a little bit early. Okay? Thank you.